So good to be in the house with each and every one of you. Also want to say a greeting to those of you who are watching online this morning. It is good to be together in worship. Uh, well, Andrew is up here with me because we've got a little announcement to make today. And let me start by saying Andrew's not going anywhere. Okay? I know sometimes people, as soon as they see a staff person on stage who they don't expect, they're like, oh my gosh, not again. <laughs> hey, no. Andrew is staying here with us. If you don't know Andrew, uh, Andrew works with our student ministry and also obviously works with our worship ministry. You see him on stage up here very often uh, as a part of leading us in worship. Um, but he is starting into a new adventure as well. And that is, he has been called to attend the Master's Institute Seminary this fall. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. It's super, super cool. So I wanted to bring Andrew up here this morning and, uh, and to ask him a simple question. What on earth were you thinking? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I don't like reading. I don't like writing. 
I'm reading like two books a week and writing like four papers a week. So <laughs> I'm in way over my head. Um, it's, it's a cliche answer, but honestly, it's the truth. Uh, I know that the Lord is calling me to seminary. Um, and so I'm going, I'm listening. Um, I don't know what the next step is. I don't know what he's called me to further. But what I do know is that he's got me here uh, for a purpose right now. And he's preparing me for something in the future. Not that he's not using me now, but he's yeah. preparing me for something. Uh, and I'm open to whatever that may be. So again, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> right. I'm here for at least two more years. <laughs> and then uh, my contract is up. Oh, so right. <laughs> uh, that's on you after that. Oh, awesome. No, well, we want to take some time to just pray for Andrew this morning um, and, uh, and to let you know that, you know, what he is stepping into is, is exploration. He's, he's at Master's Institute. He's studying pastoral ministry and theology and all those things that happen there as a part of this process, of this journey of exploration. Uh, but it means that over the next couple of years, you're going to see him doing some things. Uh, you're going to see him preaching. You're going to see him uh, attending some meetings and being a part of some of the pastoral ministry opportunities here, Community of Grace, maybe a hospital visitation, uh, maybe a part of a funeral, maybe a part of some pre-marriage counseling. There'll be a variety of different things that we're going to be exposing Andrew to. And so you'll see him in those ways. And so it's okay to think of him and see him as like, oh, that's a pastor in the making. That's a, that's a pastoral intern. We've had pastoral interns here in the past many, many times. Many have been launched from this congregation. So it's something that we celebrate together as a church, being a part of this journey with Andrew. So, um, uh, and as a little bit of a side note, uh, at the first service here, uh, Andrew's dad, Sean Kelly, and his mom, Jen, uh, and his grandma, Cheryl, were all here in worship and uh, uh, we had them come up and pray with Andrew because Sean is a pastor uh, and uh, he's a good friend of mine out in uh, Penasquitos Lutheran Church in San Diego, California. And uh, his grandmother, Cheryl, is also a pastor. Uh, so there's some generational things going on here in family, which is really, really cool. Uh, but we don't lay that on him as a burden. Instead, that's just a joy to know where it is that God may be leading and guiding um, and we trust in his guidance in all of this. So would you just extend a hand forward? We're going to pray a blessing over Andrew and uh, kind of launch him forward into all of this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for Andrew. We thank you that he is fearfully and wonderfully made and that you are now in the process of bringing him on this journey of becoming that which you already see him to be. Uh, Lord, that is such a, a joy because each one of us are on a journey like that. But this is one in particular, a vocational calling towards ministry. And Lord, we pray for your guidance over Andrew in this season. We pray for your spirit to fill him, to protect him and, and give him hope and encouragement in those times that are difficult, <laughs> in those places that stretch him, Lord, be there in the stretching in those places where he needs that comfort and, and relief, allow him, Lord, to, to fall graciously into your arms to care for him. And help us, Lord, as a congregation, to be an encouragement to Andrew, whether it be through a note or a pat on the back or a, hey, way to go, or, or even a, hey, would you pray for me? Lord, all of those things are a part of that journey that you have him on. We are grateful as a congregation to be part of that journey with Andrew. So bless him and keep him in these days ahead as he continues in all the ways that he is a blessing here at Community of Grace, to the student ministry, to the music ministry, to the technology, to leadership, to all of those different facets. And now this next part as a student at the Master's Institute. So bless him now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give him a round this morning. Hey? Amen. Amen. Awesome, man. You can step down. Let me hand this microphone back over here. Why don't you stand up and uh, let's continue to worship and come before the Lord in celebration today. Breath that I 
I'm going to sing, uh, teach you a new song. You don't know. I encourage you, if you do know it, sing out. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't just invite you to use this time to just come before our Lord and our Savior and just sit at his feet and just to say all hail King Jesus to him. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history They're on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake And the veil was torn 
What sacrifice was made as a heaven's
Hail to you, all glory and honor and power and majesty to you. Lord, help us to not just help us to not just say these words, Lord, but to believe them, to live them, Lord. That because you live, we can face tomorrow. All fear is gone. There is a reason to live because you are alive and walking with us, Lord. So, Father, just speak that truth to us today. Lord, ingrain that truth in us today, and Lord, help us to just respond with all hail, King Jesus. Lord, open our hearts and our eyes and just our minds to you today, Lord. That's all in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and take your seats this morning. Well, good morning, Grace people. It is good, so good and rich to be together, to be in worship, to be lifting our voices before the Lord. Wow, what, what a blessing. What a blessing that is. Oh, well, family. Yeah. Family. Family matters. Family ties. Family guy. Family affair. All in the family. Modern family. Mama's family. The Partridge family. The Adams family. And family feud. That's just a short sample of the titles of a bunch of television shows. Yeah, you probably recognized some of them. Maybe you recognize all of them. It's just a small sample of television programs over the last 50 years that have had the term family in the name. Of course, this doesn't include the dozens and dozens and dozens of shows that were about families, that were centered on families and family life. In fact, I would say it's way more likely that a show that shows up in the evening on television these days is something about family relationships than not. It's just a really very common theme, right? Listen, if arts and entertainment mirror reality, and I firmly believe that they do, then it is no surprise that the most common subjects that appear in the stories that draw us in are about the family relationships that are central to our stories, right? Again and again and again, television shows, movies, artwork, music is tied into some kind of a family relationship. And it's what draws us into those programs when they show up. We see ourselves in the stories, stories about husbands and wives, stories about Fathers and their sons, mothers and their daughters, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, multiple generations. We're drawn in by those stories because we see ourselves in them. And we have been on a journey together through another story. It's God's story. The narrative lectionary that we have been in this year is about covering the story of God from the beginning all the way through to the end. And what we find when we look at this story is that this story is really about God's story of his people that are captured and revealed in the family relationships of Scripture. Right? I mean, let me just give you a small sample of what's gotten us to this point in the story. The beginning of the story is the story of creation, the story of Adam and Eve, the first family, right? Right there, you've got a family. In the opening chapters, there is a creation story with a family, and it doesn't take long before things start to go sideways in that family, right? Well, I just ate what she gave me. It's her fault. Moves on, of course, into Cain and Abel and, and all these other stories that start to unpack family stories. And then we move forward into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is now a nation of families. 
This is God calling Abraham out and inviting him in and saying, listen, I'm going to make a family out of you that's going to become a great nation. And this nation is going to be a blessing to the world. You are blessed to be a blessing. Oh, what a great start to the story. Until Abraham does what Abraham does. And all these other people start getting involved in the story. And before you know it, there's layer after layer of intrigue and drama and adultery and hiding out and broken relationships. It just keeps showing up in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But then we move on to the next chapter in the story, the story of Moses and Egypt, which becomes a, really a story of a family in bondage. This family is now a whole nation, but they're all connected to each other in deep ways and connected to God. And this family is in trouble, bound and enslaved by a foreign power. And so God, through Moses, releases his family, calls his family forward into a new promised land, delivering them, and everything goes great for about a day. <laughs> Until that family starts falling apart. Trouble between Moses and his brother, leading in different directions, and in idolatry, and, and all kinds of things that start falling apart and affecting that family. So then we fast forward to another family, the family of David, King David, a king who is called to become a dynasty. And a dynasty is just a fancy way of saying, listen, you, David, are going to have sons, and they will have sons after that, and sons after that, and there will always be a king on the throne that will be a part of your dynastic family. That's the promise. That's the word towards this beloved son, David. And at the same time, you look at the story of David, and we've got adultery, and we've got broken relationships, and we've got intrigue, and we've got all kinds of horrible things happening in the background of David's life and of his family. And it continues on through his son and on to his son's sons. It only doesn't take long before this whole family starts to come apart and there's brokenness and division. And we get two whole books, actually four books, that are all about the decline and demise of this family, a divided family, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. You read through it and you just see story after story after story of kings and their sons and their daughters-in-law and, and of people who just start making a mess of everything. It's a mess. It's a mess, this divided family. And that kind of brings us up to speed on this family, these kingdoms and these kings and, and split and broken nations and broken families. That brings us up to the next chapter of God's story and God's family. And this family is now about a family in rebellion. A family in rebellion. And what God does to this family in rebellion is he raises up some people called prophets. Prophets who are called to come and speak on behalf of God to his people. When you hear the term prophet, it sometimes puts images in our mind of the fire-breathing prophet or the one who's going to foretell the future and see what's going on. Really, there's some of that that's there, but mostly the call of a prophet is to hear from God and share it with somebody else. It's really that simple. And so here we have this prophet that we're going to take a look at today, a prophet named Hosea, and what Hosea has to say, and the way in which he says it. Hosea has a message for God's family, and he actually uses the language of family to express this message as we come to this part of the story. So if you want to follow along with me, you can turn to the prophet Hosea, to the book of Hosea, and we're going to be in chapter 11, and I'm going to start reading at verse 1. So follow along if you'd like in your own Bibles. Hosea chapter 11, starting at verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness. 
with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God most high. I will by no means exalt them. These are the words of Hosea. And the voice that he uses is the voice of God speaking to his family. Or even more particularly, it's the voice of a parent speaking to a child or to children. And it is abundantly clear that these children are a rebellious mess. They're a mess. But it sounds like it could be any family, right? He speaks about Israel, and when we hear him speaking of Israel, we think, oh, yes, the nation of Israel. But then right after that, he says, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Well, that's a personal name. That's one of the tribes of Israel. So he's wanting to make it clear that I'm, I'm seeing this family, I'm seeing this nation as a father sees their children, as a parent looks to their children and sees what they're doing and has a desire for them. And God has a purpose in mind. God wants to protect, direct, and correct his children out of an expression of his affection. Protection, direction, and correction coming forth from his affection. That's God's desire with his family. It's God's desire expressed right in this beautiful poem. He calls his people, his child, Israel, out of Egypt because he wants to protect them. But if they turned instead and started worshiping other gods, they turned their back on him. So he needs to correct them. He taught them how to walk, those first steps of following. You can just see the imagery of, of holding a child by the arm and teaching them to walk. He wants to give them direction and encouragement, but they didn't even realize that it was he who was healing them, who was helping them, his divine protection. And he does this from cords of human kindness and love. There is his affection on display. But instead, they want to turn their back. They want to return back to Egypt. They want to make a bargain with Assyria. They want to do these things. They want to go in a wrong direction. And God desperately wants to correct them, but they will not repent. So instead, there's going to be a flashing sword that flashes in their cities. God's correction. This is the heart of God the Father towards his family. And it's not far from the desires of any parent towards their family. You know, during the course of November, we're stepping into a new season of prayer. And, and we're praying for the prodigals. And for those of you who hear that term, you might be thinking of the prodigal son or the story of the prodigal son. Of course, we're drawing from that imagery. But it's, it's the imagery of, of, a, of a family that is broken up because, because the children have wandered off. They've walked away. They've broken relationship. When we hear that term, prodigal children, it's, it's, it's about children who have intentionally walked away from faith in Jesus and maybe abandoned their relationship in the church or in their, in their family. And in the back of our minds, we often think, if they only understood God's protection, correction, and direction, they would certainly return. And you know, that's, that's not wrong it's just incomplete. Why? Because it makes us think that God operates the same way that we do as parents. That his view of us is the same 
as our view of our children and our relationships there. And that's not fully correct, you see, because our version of protection, correction, and direction is flawed. I know that in myself for sure. I'm a father of three adult children now. We've raised them since they were little, of course, three of them, and they're still with us now. We're still all in the same home, sharing life together. We still love and care for each other, but, but you know what? We still can get on each other's nerves. And I still think of the journey that they have been on and my desire as a parent to want to protect, direct, and correct. But here's the thing. Over years and years and years of doing that with your children, you start to repeat some things, right? And sometimes you start to see things in their life that just keep showing up again and again and again and again. I'm going to protect. I'm going to direct. I'm going to correct. I'm going to protect, I'm going to direct, I'm going to correct, I'm going to protect, I'm going to direct, I'm going to correct. And it bubbles over this protection, direction, and correction. It starts to come from a place of frustration. It bubbles up and it boils over. And sometimes the worst of us comes out instead of the best. I mean, I think about the times where protection for our children become smothering. Like we want to just wrap them in bubble wrap so that nothing could ever happen to them. No harm could ever come their way. They never see or experience any of the pain of life because that'll be good for them. But it misses the mark because of course they're going to encounter pain in this life. Of course they're going to, to, to see things and be in places that are going to be harmful and hurtful and brokenness. We live in a broken world, and we can't protect them from every one of those things. And that's a good instinct to want to protect them, but we take it too far because we think that we're the ones who have to make sure that everything goes perfect for them. Or we want to direct our children in the right way, but instead, sometimes that direction becomes coercion or manipulation. We start to want to see ourselves lived out in our children. We want to to overcome the things that we have felt like we have failed at by by making sure that our children follow a path or we live our dreams vicariously through our children. I've got an example. My oldest son, Jared, played one season of football when he was young. I think it was like fourth grade, if I remember right. Went out for football that year because he really wanted to play football. He went out and within the first couple days of practicing, he hurt his foot. Was limping a little bit while he was out there practicing. So I looked at him like any warm-hearted, protective parent would do. Suck it up! Come on, walk it off! It's not that big of a deal. You're gonna have to be tough if you're gonna play football. Get out there, be tough could see he was hurting, but, but you know what? You just got to play through the pain. Come on. He did that for a few more practices until it seemed like it wasn't getting any better. I said, all right, fine. We'll bring you to the doctor. I know what the doctor's going to say. He's going to say it's a little sprain or it's a little whatever, and, and you know, you're just going to have to kind of play through it. But fine, I'll bring you. Brought him to the doctor's office. Sat him in the doctor's office. Sent him off to go get the x-ray. Had the doctor come back in the room. The doctor looked at him and held up the x-ray and said, yeah, he broke his toe, his big toe. The steely-eyed glare that came from this young man at me. Sometimes our desire to want our child to do something or be involved in something or go somewhere or do something. The desire to direct them in the right path becomes trying to direct them in the path that we think is best without ever trusting that the Lord knows better. Why do we do this? (laughs) Why does this happen? Because, my friends, we are all prodigals. Every one of us On one level or another, we all are the ones who drift. 
We have all, like sheep, gone astray. Every one of us. And that's where we need to hear the rest of God's message. The rest of his story. Right here in Hosea. Listen to the rest of the story, starting in verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows, from Assyria fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. For I am God and not a man. Wow, there's a revelation, and it should be a word of grace to you. And here it is, friends. God is not like you. God is not like me. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. We should rejoice and hear this as a word of grace to you. God is not like you. And he's not like me, and he doesn't have the hang-ups, and he doesn't have the self-confidence issues, and he doesn't have the anger issues. He doesn't have any of those things that we attribute to ourselves and sometimes attribute to God and then try to act in that way towards our family. No, God is God, and you are not. Thank God for that. His heart is moved differently than ours. Listen, you're a mess, <laughs> And so am I. But Jesus makes us family. And that means you are a beloved mess. You're a beloved mess. It comes forth right from this passage. God calls you beloved. And his greatest desire is to take you in his arms and lovingly restore you into his family. That's his desire. I so expect as I read this passage about God's heart being changed. My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. For me, I think about all my frustration being aroused, right? Or all my anger being aroused. Or all of my disappointment being aroused. Or all of those human things that I can feel as a parent, and I'm sure you have felt them too, for your children no matter what their age but not for God. Instead, his compassion is aroused. You know what compassion means? It means to suffer with. <coughs> Excuse me. Compassion means to suffer with. And I know that there are parents in this room who have felt that suffering with their children. That is the heart of God. To see our children struggling and suffering. Of course, we have a heart that desires to, to help them steer away from those things, to have them avoid the pain, avoid the, 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 all the things that go along with that. But it doesn't do us any good to try and fix them in our own strength or think that we're the ones who have to save them, we're the ones who have to rescue them, we're the ones who have to deliver them. You can't even deliver yourself. So instead, trust in the one who is the perfect father and who welcomes his children with open arms from whatever place they are at. And if you have any doubt of that, listen to this from Mark chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. When I listen to that passage and try to see it in my own mind, and I invite you to try and see it in your mind too, I don't know this for certain, but I can easily imagine some of these little children actually being children of the disciples. And the disciples being in that place that so often we become as parents. Hey, I've got important business to do over here with Jesus. Would you just, just sit, sit down? Just, just go over it. Just, come, just stop it. Don't, don't bother Jesus. He's got things to do. He's got important things to do. Don't go wasting his time. And Jesus looks at that and says, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Don't get in the way of my children coming to me. Don't stand in the way. Let them come to me. Because the kingdom of God belongs to people like this, who understand their need, who recognize their position as a child, who God picks up in his arms and embraces. That is the heart of Jesus, and it has always been the heart of his father as well. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that the Old Testament God is just this whole terrible God of wrath. Not at all. You hear it here in Hosea. The same God is that same God that is, that is here for us in Jesus who says, no, let them come. And that means you too. You will never love your children as much as God loves you and them. And you are not God, so stop thinking it's up to you to fix your children or save your children or rescue your children or to fix your parents or judge your parents or all the things that we can do as children of our earthly parents who are prodigals as well. It has to go both ways for us, and it does go both ways for us. So we need to start trusting the one who promises to call his rebellious, stubborn, broken, sinful children back home. Do you hear that last line? He says, I will settle them in their homes. So if you're a parent today who's wondering about your child, maybe your adult child, maybe that one that you see as the prodigal, first remember that you are a part prodigal too whom God has welcomed home. And then second, trust in the one who calls his prodigals home and settles them in homes. Turn to him. Let your prayers be towards him. In those places where you feel like you have failed, which you certainly have and so have I, come before the one who offers compassion, for the one who offers forgiveness, for the one who offers correction and direction and protection in your life out of his deep, deep affection for you. And trust that he has that same affection towards those who have walked away. He is the one who calls prodigal children home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, here we are again recognizing our own desperate need and, Lord, the hearts of many in this room who are parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and, and then children and nephews and nieces and, and grandchildren and grandparents and all of those different roles in the messy family lives that we live in. Lord, you see every situation. You know every heart and you know the heart of our children more than we ever will. You know the heart of our parents more than we could ever possibly understand. And in this broken world, Lord, we come to you saying, Lord, forgive us. Lord, in your deep, deep compassion, rescue us. Do that work in me, Lord. And we trust, Lord, that you, who have called our children to yourself in baptism, are the one who will chase them down, who will find them where they are, who will, with that lion's voice, roar and call them home. 
into the safety of your safe keeping. We put that burden on you, Lord, trusting in your goodness because you are not like us, and thank God for that. We pray for our children. We pray for our parents. We pray for our nephews and nieces and aunts and uncles and all the broken people in our community and our messed beloved family that you call family. Jesus, call us home into relationship with you and relationship with one another again today. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Darren, for that word of encouragement. Um, hallelujah. Praise God that he is not like us. Um, we're going to have a time of offering and response, a chance to um, both respond with our gifts and our giving and, and just in a prayer or two. Um, if you have brought a physical offering, um, there will be ushers that will be passing around um, little plates. Um, otherwise, we have a QR code that you can give through, or you can go on to gracepeople.church. Um, so, Father, I just ask that you would bless these gifts that we're about to receive. Lord, um, help us to remember that just they are for furthering your kingdom, and Lord, I just pray that they would just send your word out. That's all your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Ashes, you may come forward.
down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Lord, you are a good and kind God, and you are good and kind to us. Lord, you have taken us from backgrounds and pasts that are dark, that are full of a lot of hurt, and you have redeemed us, Lord. Father, um, I don't know where everyone comes from today. Lord, I know for sure that we all have broken and messy families. So, Lord, wherever someone is hurting, Lord, where there is wounds that need to heal. There are wrongs that have been done to us that need to be forgiven. That need to be made right. Lord, I just ask that you would work in those areas. Lord, just as you forgive us, help us to forgive others for the wrongs that they have done to us. Lord, help us to to not look to anyone else but you for that healing, Father. God, I just ask that you would uh, just do this work in us today, Lord. I saw your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Um, I'm going to invite Chris Brecky up, and he is going to introduce our prayer focus for this month. Good morning. The Lord be with you. The Lord is with you, blessing you, using you for the blessing of others. Thank you for being people of faith. Our focus this month is on the prodigals, people who uh, have walked away from the Lord. We care about them. God loves them. God's going to use us to bring about some good. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you, God of all goodness and love. We thank you that you've called us, that we are yours. Lord, we lift up before you this day our exiles, those living separated from you, those people who have no interest in friendship or being a part of your flock. Lord, we ask you to continue your work for them. Pursue them with your great love. Do not give up on them, even if they have given up on you. Lord, we ask you would call out their name in a way that they can hear you that you would stir up their lives, that they might recalibrate the trajectory of their days. Lord, we ask you to, to reach on in, make a way, make a way through the barriers and blockades that have developed, that they too might come to you, might know the joy of life, the purpose of days, the wellspring of your love, the library of your wisdom, the intimacy with your throne, O oh Lord, work. And wherever possible, Lord, we ask you to use us on their behalf, and, Lord, if it not be us, then we ask that you would send the right person, the right circumstance, the right thought, the right message to win them back to yourself. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our friend. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Chris. Just a reminder, too, that um, if you need prayer or you just want to spend some time after the service praying, um, we have our chapel area over in the sanctuary. Um, there are people over there willing to pray with you. It's open during the week. Um, there are some materials that you can use to just kind of guide you through prayer. Um, I encourage you, just go make a view to that. Um, even if it doesn't feel like prayer is doing anything, it has the power to change us at the very least and humble us before our God. So I encourage you guys to go over there and utilize that. Um, and churches, we're talking about prayer. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have some next steps as a church that you can get involved in. So I invite you guys to look at these next steps. Hi, I'm Melinda Kern, CGLC Student Ministries Director. Here are some next steps you can take at Community of Grace. Confirmation students don't miss the second faith formation class after services today. This one is focused on the Ten Commandments. Today at 11.45, we will meet in LL9 downstairs to grow deeper in our faith. A light lunch is provided. If you are not a confirmation student but are interested in learning more, please join us today. Then, don't forget to join us for the family meeting this evening at 5 o'clock. We will enjoy a family-style meal as we celebrate what God has done and explore what God is continuing to do. Results of the recent MAP survey will be part of the discussion. We want you to be there to participate in thoughtful discussion at your table and actively share your impressions. Children up to fifth grade will enjoy a pizza dinner and a movie in the Children's Ministry Center while the parents talk. Finally, our diaper drive wraps up at the end of the month. Last year, you generously donated about 50,000 diapers to the food shelf for distribution. We hope to be as generous this year. Remember, government assistance programs do not cover diapers, so this particular item is greatly needed. We are having curbside drop-offs in the front and back of the church on November 14th, 15th, and 16th, if that makes it easier for you. Or you can donate online and let us do the shopping for you. We will fill the food shelf truck with diapers on Thanksgiving Eve, November 22nd, and send them off to keep bottoms dry throughout the area. We will celebrate with Thanksgiving Eve worship and pie. Worship begins at 6.30. Be sure to pick up your copy of The Current this morning to get plugged in. Or find out more information online at gracepeople.church. Have a blessed week, church. Woo! A quick note for you as you are leaving, um, we do need some help stacking chairs this morning. So if you could stack chairs before you leave, um, stack them six high, that would be super appreciated. So church, I'm going to invite you guys to stand. As you go into the world and you are the light of Christ to the world today, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and serve the Lord.